Hello, hey. Warwick. Whoa. Is that like <laughs> 600 episodes out of 600 episodes we've talked over the top of one another? It's a race to be first. It is. Mostly I lean back and yet then you lean back and we just it gets weird and awkward and that's not for know. any of our listeners. Body language. We should do a body language course. It might help us. Mm, it was one of my biggest fears when we started working over Zoom and recording over Zoom. Remember right back in the beginning, I was really stubborn and said, nope, we're absolutely doing this in person every single time. Hang on, time. hang on, hang on. Did you say you were stubborn? Yes. Is that the joke for today? No. <laughs> uh, move on. Otherwise, I'm going to dig myself an even deeper hole. No. Let's go. Sorry that our listeners can't see my eyes at the Rolling. moment glaring at you. All right, come on. I've got a joke for today. How do you identify a dogwood tree? No, I'm not going to get this one either. <laughs> it's bark. Oh. G'day, I'm Roz. And I'm Nick, sometimes Coxie, mostly Nick. This is the Tradies in Business podcast, and we're here to share a bunch of tips, ideas, tactics that you can put in place to get change happening in your trade business right now. If you're really lucky, we're going to entertain you with a few mum jokes, and more importantly, a bunch of fantastic guests that will educate you in all things you need to know about trade business, but we do promise to do it with a whole bunch of fun along the way. I'm a self-confessed idiot, so strap yourself in and... And enjoy another episode. Should have seen that one coming like a freight train, but I did not. No. Well done. Well played, Coxie. <laughs> <laughs> nice little pun too with the knot. Yes. All right. So uh, we have a guest today who is being very polite and professional and uh, standing by grinning politely and professionally at Nick's joke. Well, rolling his eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Cal. Uh, we're joined by Cal McPherson from Young Blood Men's Mental Health. I have no idea what we're going to be talking about today, Cal. <laughs> Mental health, I reckon. <laughs> Ooh, it's, it's a fair chance. <laughs> Certainly not my shit jokes. Um, Cal, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. I'm sure it's all yours. So, uh, mate, tell us a bit about you and how you came to be sitting here speaking to like you know world-class podcasters like us well i can hardly believe my luck <laughs> i can hardly believe the sound of my ego after that little uh, intro it's been a, a long journey but sitting here with you two it's clearly all been worth it <laughs> <laughs> it's the pinnacle of your career mate oh cow you fit I right in i never walls um but here we are the walls are just dripping with sarcasm at the moment. I'm going to bottle some of it up for later. Uh, if you don't laugh and cry. Very true. <laughs> so I've been podcasting for four and a half years now. Mm -hmm. The show is Young Blood Men's Mental Health. I speak to young guys from all around Australia under 40. Uh, that's considered young. I agree. No worry, I think it's young. <laughs> you won't be talking to me on your show. And we chat about people's life journeys, essentially relating to mental health. Speaking about mental health is a great way to just talk about what it is to be a human. And it's, we talk about a really broad range of diverse experiences and, and all kinds of people where really uh, it's important to me to make sure it's a show that's for everyone or representing every kind of person who's had every kind of experience. Because although we're all quite different on the surface, we go through very similar things and we have similar wants and, and needs and challenges. So it's about showing people uh, how similar we are and therefore how much we are able to take out of other people's stories and apply it to our own lives. Mm. And it does focus particularly on men and young men and that's because I am still a relatively young man. I'm just turned 30. I started it when I was 25. So I'm speaking to that age group and that comes out of recognizing that there weren't really platforms for young men specifically talking about mental health publicly from a lived experience angle. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to create a space for men to do that because I think there's a real need for it to show men examples of other men talking about the things that men don't typically talk mm -hmm. about. And my show is video as well, so you get to see the characters who come on the show. And I love getting tough, stereotype-looking 
hyper masculine blokes on who you'd never think in a million years would talk about their feelings and what they've been through, but they they do open up, and I think that is true strength and bravery to be able to do that. Mm. And my motivation to start the show came out of losing a good mate of mine to suicide in 2019 and enduring that pain and looking around trying to find some other stories to be able to relate to, not being able to find it. And then having my eyes open to just how many young men, but also their families and and people of all kinds are touched by suicide and Mm -hmm. mental illness and the fact that uh, we need to to talk about it as as a first step because that's where action comes from. So that's uh, a brief synopsis. I'll shut up for a bit. That's the best goddamn bio I think we've ever had. Cal, well done. Yeah. And you answered about 15 questions I had as you were working your way through. I uh, know that's <laughs> the worst for, for a guest, isn't it? Like, no, it's okay. We've got plenty more. That's right. <laughs> promise we've got you. Questions you probably haven't even thought of. <laughs> no. I, um, Cal, so you mentioned about your friend. I'm very sorry to hear that. That's That's always very challenging. I don't know too many people that haven't been brushed with a similar sort of experience, unfortunately, in one form or another. And I always like to understand, was that your first real experience with some challenging mental health or had you had previous experience to that? Yeah, that was my first experience. And fortunately to that point, I had a very good upbringing, got a wonderful family, been lucky with my health. So I hadn't been faced with any serious health complications or with a a trauma to that point. So it was completely out of left field thing that totally rocked my world and took the rose tinted glasses off. And it was the first time being faced with death that came suddenly and far before that person's time. Mm -hmm. And it was James, I called him JMO. Uh, He was as resilient and courageous and fun-loving and good-spirited as they come. And if you would have asked me, I would have said he would have been the most likely of anyone I know to succeed and absolutely did not fit the stereotype of someone who was severely depressed. But that's a huge part of Mm -hmm. all this, of course, is how insidious mental illness can be and suicide, suicidal ideation and how good people are at hiding these things that they go through. And he was a, a perfect case of that. So no, to that point, I, I hadn't had it. And that meant that I, I wasn't looking for any of the signs and I, I didn't I didn't know what I know now. And in hindsight, you can look back and you can realize that there was a path that led up to that and mm. you could have picked it. I can pick it now and have since. But before you have an experience like that, unfortunately, you're not looking for it. And I think definitely to an extent, you don't really believe that that could happen. It's one lucky you always hear. I wouldn't have thought that would that would happen to me. Now that's the sort of thing that happens to someone else, and that's not true. It happens, mm. like you said, that just about everyone's touched by this in in some way, which is why it resonates so much. And when it does happen to you, it's like oh shit, you realise that we are so fragile and fallible, and that life's very precious, and uh, it's just such a a tragedy, and I think largely an avoidable tragedy. A permanent, um, a permanent solution to a temporary problem is the phrase, and I definitely think that that is true. And that in the majority of cases, people actually don't want to die; they're just in so much pain at that point in time that they can't see past it. And so, my podcast is really about giving people tools and uh, hopefully helping them to build a support network so that when those times come, they can survive those storms because I've seen life get better quickly. Mm. afterwards. Cal, given that you're you're dealing with such a heavy topic on the podcast, I wonder, and, and presumably a little bit like we have today, we've had a brief chat before we sort of kicked off on the podcast. Um, I assume you do something a little bit similar. So therefore there's a huge space for big bombshells, tricky issues, big stuff to come up during the podcast. And I imagine that would be really quite confronting. We've had a couple of incidents here where we've in, interviewed some um, people that have been through some pretty horrific stuff and that can be really challenging to steer and navigate your way through to deliver an outcome for the listener because the listener's here, yes, to hear a story, but also to take a lesson or a learning or something from it. I wonder how you uh, have navigated that throughout your four and a half years. Yeah, well, the vetting is important. You know, as podcast hosts, that you're only as good as your guests. Mm-hmm. You're in safe hands today. 
You're only as good as your guests. And when we're talking about mental health and suicide, there is a duty of care to make sure I'm only having people on who are ready. Yes. Mm-hmm. I'm their mm-hmm. story and young blood is always ending on a, on a positive note. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's really important. We don't want to have people on where it's potentially going to cause more harm than good. And we need people to leave those episodes feeling inspired and hopeful and with a uh, path forward because that's really what it's about. So I do put a lot of effort into researching the people that I have on the show, having a chat to them beforehand. I like to know as much as I can before starting the conversation so that I'm not being caught off guard as we go along. Uh, it's important to know everything that's going to be in that chat and to be able to guide it down that road because we want to get the most out of it. And yeah, we don't want to end up in a situation where someone feels like they um, they shouldn't have said something or it's, it's in some way going to damage them or me or whatever. But that's not... It's not a it's not a massive concern. It's just um, taking care, knowing what we want to get out of the the podcast. And the thing is, now guests know what the show is about, and they they know why they want to come on, and they know what the cause is, uh, and we're on the same page and, and aligned about that. And I just make it very clear that hey, no matter what you you've been through, you need to be in a place now where things are, are good enough where you can reflect, and um, you can um, promote a, a message that's going to be helpful and and end on a positive note because on the other side of that it's not like okay i went through this bad thing that ended and now it's all good and i went off into the sunset because that's a fairy tale and not real life when it comes to this stuff it's about managing it into the future and also the fact that even when you can be doing really good you can only be you can be a couple of things away from that's right things going wrong again so it's about being human being responsible learning how to manage stuff uh, and that's the, the message that we try to promote with it in the beginning, Cal, when you first started doing this, as a young fella of, so what did you say, you were 25, 26, you're quite young. Um, these are pretty big topics to be talking about. Did you ever feel a bit like a fish out of water? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I didn't. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, they are, they are. But they're also the most interesting topics to talk about. I think, in my view, some of them have been seen as taboo and with a lot of these things like trauma and um abuse some nasty stuff it really is important to talk about it because those difficult things can really fester in in the darkness and and just get worse and and people feel alone and feel lost without some being able to bring it forward and and own their struggles and be proud of it and show others that there's there's nothing wrong with struggling and being human and in fact it is part of the human condition so although those topics are tough and they need to be spoken about someone needs to do it and it also allows for a really deep connection between me and the guests and hopefully between the guests and the listeners. Mm-hmm. And it brings us closer together as a community, which I see as a tremendous privilege to have blokes who I've never met before be willing to sit down with me and share the toughest thing they've ever been through with me and with the young blood audience. It's just such a privilege and such an awesome thing to be able to do. And I don't take that for granted. And that really combats the other side of it where some of those conversations are really tough and I do feel them and I am empathetic and I am human as well. Uh, but I, I never forget that it's it's such a privilege and it does a lot of good and the guests get a huge amount out of it and we feel like we're, we're doing something to help. And I think as a human, once you find your thing that you can do with your skills that help in some way, it's a very addictive feeling where you don't want to you don't want to give it up because you're talking about meaning and purpose there and I get so much meaning and purpose out of this and I think often you don't get that without without some hard work and without it being tough and that's sort of where that meaning and purpose comes from. Mm-hmm. So the topics, topics are tough but they mean something and they need to be spoken about and yeah, it does help make a difference so that makes it worthwhile. And people coming on the show, I mean, as you know, having guests and takes the pressure off you because mm-hmm. uh, it's up to the guests. And I always think about it like I'm, I'm helping them to get their story across as strongly as possible. And the praise for me is seeing the comments or getting the messages from people about how awesome that person's story is and how how great they are and what people took away from it. That's the ultimate praise for me. So yeah, that's how I look at it. Mm-hmm. 
I uh, I actually just wandered off there, Cal. Um, I'm going to be I'm going to be honest. Um, I had my own personal experience with uh, some mental health issues and uh, suicide uh, when I was about 25 years of age, actually, um, which was where my personal, not so much a, a quest or a crusade, but just a a focus or a you know a side um, interest in mental health, and then obviously into young people's mental health, and that's kind of. It's not a, a, a explicit part of what I do as a business coach or anything else, but it was certainly there in terms of that purpose-driven thing that you talked about. So when I, I got into coaching and mentoring and business coaching some 15 odd years ago now, it formed a part of my story. And <clears throat> it's kind of weird. It, it There seems to have been events throughout my life, a bit like you, you know, with, with the, the very sad loss of your mate, uh, where even within my family, uh, there's been events happen. And in some ways, I've felt unprepared for those things, but also somewhat prepared for them. Um, it, with the guests that you speak with, it, do they also, because they've been touched by it or they've had a personal experience, like do they also tend to gravitate towards doing some sort of work in this area or is there no pattern there at all? Yeah, a lot do. I think when you're faced with really tough circumstances or a personal tragedy, some people feel a drive to want to do something about it. In my case, like, and people who lo lose someone to suicide, the number one thing you want to do is bring that person back. Mm. And tragically, you can never do that. And the next mm. best thing is you can you can help someone else who might be in that situation or going down that road and you can make some contribution to people not feeling that way or, or being able to drag themselves out of that pit. And so that can become a mission as it has in my case. I don't think it's anyone's responsibility to respond to tragedy in that way where it's like, okay, this, this thing happened. Now I have to use it to create this initiative. Mm. I think it's awesome. A lot of people, especially in mental health, that has been the, the case because it's just so deeply emotional and therefore emotive and therefore drives us and shapes who we become and that and people want to use that pain and do something with it use it for good which i admire and try to emulate myself so there's been a lot of people that have started charities uh started their own initiative doing work in this space mm. and i think there's a, there's quite a lot of that around australia now i mean i I see it because it's in my algorithm. So I don't think it's necessarily absolutely everywhere as it seems like it is to me, but I would say hundreds of people who've got their own story, who've started a thing, whether it's a, a clothing brand or it's it's a, a workshop charity or it's a, a public speaking traveling band type thing. There's, there's a lot of that grassroots mental health initiative stuff happening now and a lot of it being driven by young people which is mm. awesome to see and that definitely didn't exist 10 years ago and mm. i think that that's what is giving us this groundswell of change around the country and it can be quite defeating to see the stats and know that things aren't improving yet numbers wise in terms of how many people die by suicide there's still nine australians a day and seven of them are men but we can't let that get us down because there's no doubt that there is change happening and things are moving forward because we're having these conversations everywhere. We're, we're, talk, we're seeing and talking about mental health all the time and with that comes people changing their attitudes and taking different action, seeing their mental health like their physical health ideally and starting to manage things better. And when we talk about those numbers, it's just it's generational change. These things take decades to get better and i just think about where would we be if we weren't having any of these conversations if we didn't have any of these people doing all this work that they're doing selflessly all the time what kind of situation would we be in then and we can bet that it would be worse so i try to see it in that positive light and then there's people who they're they're giving back they're they're um being able to process what they've been through and, and do something good with it is is coming on the podcast and sharing their story and that's a really exciting opportunity for people who 
they might not have gone and started something yet or they might not feel that that's what they need to do but they can they can process their story and articulate it and they can put that out there and know that that's that's helping someone else and that definitely happens because just about every guest will say to me i've had so many messages from people i never would have thought would have gone through something and they're all telling me about one how inspired they are by this story that i've told but they're also opening up to me about themselves and i just think if you do that enough that's going to change the world over time and we just try to encourage being that person in your family or in your friendship group where you're open to having those discussions and you're able to be there for other people and you're able to be honest with yourself and be someone who can who can speak up and take action when it's necessary and if you've got one of those if you've got one of those people in, in every family and every friendship group then you're going to be living in a, in a better world eventually mm. Cal, it would take a lot of trust i would think for your guests to be comfortable to come and share their stories because they are so emotive um and it would often create a lot of emotion in them and some anxiety perhaps even within sharing this story because so many of us keep it from family and friends in the early days trust is something that's earned of course and I presume now your guests more than likely reach out to you or uh, you know it, it, I guess with longitude in any game it changes how we source what we're looking for or how those people start to come to us in the beginning though I can imagine it could have been pretty tricky to earn the trust of some gentlemen that might want to come and share their story what was that like yeah, you're right. So probably for the first well, like 80 or so episodes, I think it was mostly me finding people, looking at topics and who might fit that topic or people, stories that I could see online who might work for that sort of thing and then going to them and, and doing it that way. And then in the last couple of years, it's very much the other way where I, because it's, it's established now and it's reasonably out there, I've got people regularly wanting to come on it, which is an honor and really cool so we have created something that people want to be involved in of course it's all a volunteer selfless thing where people are coming in and giving up their time and and putting their story out there and being vulnerable like that and i have got tremendous respect for all of those men who've been willing to do that um but since the beginning although it was a bit harder to get people in the chair to start with because of what it is, because of the cause and, and what it's about and the fact that it does touch so many people's lives and it does mean so much to people who've gone through mental health related things, people have really jumped at the chance. And I suppose it's given me a lot of faith in humanity, seeing how many people, like they love the chance to be able to help someone and mm. to be able to use their story in a positive way and giving them the platform to do that. I mean, we always say, oh, men never talk, they don't want to talk. And I found that it's just so not true. Mm. Uh, well, you can't shut them up. Uh, <laughs> right, which is great. It's just about giving people that space and that permission to be able to have those conversations. And I reckon so many blokes are actually itching to do it. It's just they generally feel like there's nowhere to go with that in their personal lives. And yeah, even those who aren't on the podcast, the fact that I do a mental health podcast means that I get to have all of those conversations just in my life because people go like, oh, yeah, you, the mental health podcast, and then they start talking about whatever it is, uh, which is which is just, it's awesome to be able to do that and have those conversations. So, yeah, the people believe in the cause and they want to be, they want to be part of it. They want to help their fellow man and are really just a, a catalyst and a, a channel for people to be able to do that. And blokes who probably never get the chance to, to do it, once they see someone else do it, they start doing it. They start speaking up and, and having a chat because even though, we, if we're, even though we might not talk, we've still got this happening inside of us. We've still got that dialogue in our head all day. And as soon as you see like, oh, here's, here's some other people who are uh, open to having that conversation, they just had that chat, then that, that need to want to speak about how you're really feeling as well, it becomes becomes pretty strong. You see that all the time. Also with public speaking and a men coming up afterwards and as soon as they see someone else do it, they're like, yeah, me too in a way. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's a beautiful thing. That's why we do it. I, I think for men particularly, 
it's seeing other blokes like them who get up there and uh it's not about being a, a, a blubbering mess or needing to talk about your feelings at every moment of the day but it's like okay there's a person they got up there that was something that i think would be uh pretty tough to do they did it i respect them more for doing it and actually i would like to do that mm -hmm. uh well mm -hmm. and even if you're not ready to talk it's about planting that seed in your mind that you're not alone and there's no shame in it and uh there's so many other people who have felt that way because we do typically we think it's just me has this problem i it's really weak i can't carry the the burden that everyone else is carrying and and we have comparison be the thief of joy and, and uh deluded in thinking that everyone else has got got it sorted and, and we're the ones who can't get our shit together and it's just mm. not the place. No. Kel, having spoken with so many men uh, about this topic, you know, not just suicide, mental health and, and everything that sort of gets bundled up with all of that, I imagine you would have seen perhaps some, not patterns, but maybe there's some key things that you've discovered, you know, it's almost like a research project where you interview that many people, um, you know, in the social sciences, you'd sort of start to draw conclusions and recognize some things that are going on. Has there been any discoveries that you feel you've made uh, through chatting with so many guys on this topic? Yeah, you really do notice similarities. And that's what I said in terms of we look different on the surface, but we want the same things. We face a lot of the same challenges and that's men, but it's women as well it's just us as as human beings i think one of the really dominant things is no matter who we are we we need to feel value and we need to feel like we can add value to the community and, and other people and we need to have a reason we've got to have a reason to be able to get up in the morning and, and do what we do and a lot of the time for people who've been suicidal and and down to rock bottom their story will be that doing it for them wasn't enough. Uh, just doing it for looking after themselves and, and living uh, as an individual, that that didn't do it for them. And that it, it came down to having a, a kid to live for or um, a loved one. And that became their reason and, and that becomes enough. Sometimes it's people had that relationship with themselves where they hated themselves for whatever reason, often based on trauma they've gone through that was nothing to do with, you know, not their fault. And they, through a lot of work, learn to love themselves eventually. And that's a, that's a beautiful thing too. I think that's very impactful. I have guys on who will say, you know, they hated the way that they were and they didn't treat people well and they were, aggressive and they would scare people and that that was all based on fear and insecurity and the lack of ability for them to be able to cope with what they've been through and understand themselves and then we see men who take the the action to learn as they go along and and get better and not say not believe the narrative of oh well, this is my story i'm this person i hate who that person is but that's just my lot in life so that's too bad for me and too bad for everyone else in my life. It's some um, people understanding that at the end of the day, we, we are autonomous beings and you need to be responsible for yourself and you need to lead with action. And if something's not working, you can't just bang your head on the wall and continue to do so. You have the power within yourself to be able to make things change over mm. time. And for men, I think it's really important to preach that, you're going to be the the strongest, most effective, most uh, the best protector, the best provider you can be if you're brave enough to be honest with yourself and take good care of yourself and let other people in when things aren't going so well because that's going to allow you to have longevity and keep everything together and keep doing all those things that you want to do. And that's how we want men to approach it rather than, I want to be the best protector and provider and the, the man in my eyes of what a man should be. And that means that I don't let anyone know ever that I'm struggling. And if I am, I just push that away and pretend like it's not a problem because that always ends the same way, which is it gets bottled up to the point where it explodes and it's a disaster for often for your personal health and also the people that you do love and care about. And then there's 
hideous feelings of shame and guilt attached to that mm-hmm. all because we were trying to keep up this appearance of i'm the strong resilient stoic man who has the world on his shoulders and, and never budges and that's how people need to see me but ironically that just made you way less capable mm-hmm. um so that's how i think we need men to think about it is hey if you want to be all these things which there's nothing wrong with being which men definitely should be allowed to be 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 strong and, and protect women god like look after women please it's the other thing uh be have self-respect and, and be secure in yourself and treat people well you know if you want to be that guy it starts with being able to be honest with yourself and people around you and you know that that is not an easy thing to do because people don't don't do it and you know that 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 takes real strength and real bravery because men would much sooner you know run into battle or jump in front of a bullet to save someone they love sometimes rather than just admit what they're actually going through that can be the hardest thing for people so you know it takes real strength to do it but in just about every single case once we do talk about it it improves things tenfold and we're actually able to move forward finally and always it's the it's the waiting it's the build up it's the worrying it's that angst behind it before finally getting to that point that is so much worse for people than actually having the levy break and just coming forward with it and then realizing like oh that was largely in my head and mm-hmm. And even if it even if it wasn't, and there are difficult parts about coming forward with whatever that is, that's the only way to make progress. And the worst place you can be is just stuck in your head, just going around, and around, and around, and around, and around, and never getting anywhere. How can you give us a few practical tips on what it looks like um, for somebody maybe to be struggling with their mental health, and then you know give us the opportunity as friends family colleagues to be able to recognize that something might be wrong and then perhaps give us some tips on what we can do yeah so i was prefaced by i'm not a clinician so i i base all of this off of having a lot of these conversations with people who are and who have been in this position and what's helped them and what hasn't helped them so i think some of the typical things that we can look out for for colleagues and, and loved ones is just a change in someone uh, it, in terms of withdrawing, perhaps they're not enjoying things that they used to enjoy or they're, they're missing out on a lot of social occasions. Uh, they might even make offhand comments in a self-deprecating way, uh, which actually might have a hint of truth to them. Mm-hmm. where you know if you comments like oh yeah sometimes i reckon it'd just be better if i just wasn't here or like those sort of offhand comments which you can easily brush off and be like oh yeah that's that's just nothing but sometimes people are actually doing that as a as a cry for help mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. don't just brush stuff off especially if people are doing it repeatedly mm-hmm. and i think sometimes that can be like a almost like a reflex from people who need help and perhaps can't acknowledge that and might make those comments without even being all that conscious of it and that that's coming from a space where somewhere in you is looking it thinks that there's a problem and and that you need help and you need someone to step in but you've got no idea what to where to start with that so Mm -hmm. just listening out for those kinds of comments that allude to self-harm in a joking way because there's often a bit of truth behind that Mm -hmm. um but especially for parents of, of kids, um, like sleep patterns, people stay, staying in, in bed all day or their whole demeanor is changing, um, really looking for those behavioral changes. And then I guess, um, yeah, just, just how people are carrying themselves, how they're speaking um, and how engaged they are compared to how they have been in the past. And like that's sort of your best bet. Uh, and that's all obviously that's all guesswork so that's kind of the hard that's 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 not the best way to to do it that that can give you a a tip off but really the best thing you can do is is ask them is ask yeah. and even if you don't think something's wrong like we always say oh hey how are you yeah great well that's just like everyone said that but actually actually say that to people when actually ask that question really so anyway, it's appropriate. I mean, we can't spend all day, everyone we see, so, no, really, how are you? Because <laughs> <laughs> but, 
But for for those people where you do really want to know and you think maybe they haven't actually really been asked that, you can ask that again. You can say, you say, oh, hey, how are you? Yeah, yeah, doing, doing good, I'm fine. Now you, you can say, no, really, how are you? Or you can say, hey, I've 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 noticed lately, um, you know, you didn't, you haven't come to these this last couple of things, and and perhaps you you just seemed a little bit off. I'm just wondering, mm. um, you know, is is there anything going on? Because you can talk to me, and that's all that needs to be. And they might come forward and and tell you something, or they might initially. Uh, rebuff it and say oh no, no i'm fine and then you might find that a, a day or a week later they come to you and say oh actually and that's why it's good to follow up as well so i think for blokes in particular if you say oh hey now are you, are you doing all right and they go yep and you go all right sweet and then that's, that's, that's <laughs> um, and it doesn't mean that every day you have to be nagging them because you, you really just got to invite people and open the door and yeah. have them come to you um, you can't drag stuff out of people, but you can let them know that you're there for them. And I think that's the that's the best thing that you can do to help someone base off the people who I've spoken to who've been suicidal or really needed help. The ones that they talk about who really helped them were people who just sat in the mud with them. Uh, so showing people that you're there for them, creating that space, and then just shutting up and listening to them once they want to speak. The thing that we often want to do, especially parents, is jump in and try and fix the problem. And that's the worst thing that you can do initially because it just makes the pe- the person want to um, bottle it back up again and, and pushes them away. So you, you've got a good intentions. Obviously, you're trying to fix the problem for someone that you love. Mm. But the first step is always needs to be to just listen to them, to validate them and not try to solve the problem and just let them air that out and then the follow on to that is what do you need from me what can i do to help rather than telling them just ask them and let them tell you that uh it's it's different if it's an imminent risk if, if someone's at imminent risk of suicide then you call in the police mm-hmm. or in the ambos but that's not often the case so it's uh if they are able to open up to you it's like really listening to them not just waiting to talk and then asking them where do you want to go from here or or how can I support you? And then they're gonna feel like they're gonna feel validated by that and cared for. And then they're actually going to bring you in on that. Um whereas if you go the other way of people start talking and it makes you feel uncomfortable and your first thing you say is oh well we you need to go see a psychiatrist now. Uh then you're doing oh that's not my problem. This freaks me out and that makes that person feel that way. And it's a tough thing beyond being on the other side of helping someone because it can be really confronting. And for someone like me, I have these conversations all the time, so I've normalized it a lot. But mm. in a lot of cases, it might be the first time that, you, that you've ever done that. And a way to make that simple for yourself is just remember, okay, just listen to them, you know, put a hand on their shoulder, just nod and hear them out, keep it simple, and then ask them how you can help them. And mm. that, that makes it easier to approach. I imagine rather than, okay, I'm going to have to try and suggest this, but I'm going to have to guess where they're up to in this cycle. And then maybe I can get them in with this person. And I know that person helped that person. So we'll, we'll, we'll do that. And then you're trying to push this plan on them without ever bringing them into it and asking mm. them. So that's one thing that I don't think you necessarily know unless you've, you've heard it from lots of people who've been there, but every everyone says that it's those who were able to just sit with them be there for them tell them and show them they cared about them and ask them how to help that made a big difference Mm. i want to give a shout out to the helplines that we have in australia as well because we had an incident where a family friend rang at 2 a.m on a random weekend because he was sitting in a space where he was contemplating taking his own life such a courageous thing for this gentleman to do the problem for us at that time was, of course, we weren't equipped. We didn't know what to do or, or how to assist. And so whilst one of us was on the phone, the other one actually called through to the helplines to see what advice we could get. And they gave very similar advice to what you've just given, Cal. Um, and so I just want to encourage you, if you're listening and you find yourself in a situation, you're not sure how to handle it, the police, the AMBOs, and also our helplines, hmm. um, Kids Helpline, where we're talking about a child being involved, Lifeline, Beyond Blue, they're all there to support you, to help you have the right tools so that you can assist somebody when you're with them. Um, it's not 
a case that you need to know what to do to help someone. Often, as Cal saying, you just need to know how to listen and they can even help you understand how to do that in a way that helps that person in that critical moment. It's a bit yeah, that's, that's a great point because these are, these are tools that you learn and if you don't know, you don't know. And it's like mm. mysterious, scary water to wade into where you've got no idea what you're doing and it's all mm. very freaky, but there are actual steps. There is a There is a formula for that. My dad is a volunteer at Lifeline Mm -hmm. and they have their steps and and how they go about it very clearly mapped out and that is the path Mm -hmm. for everyone uh, to follow. So totally, if you're someone who is concerned about someone and you're not sure how to to handle that, there's lots of info on the the internet, but you can just call one of these help lines and ask them. And also, if you're someone who's struggling, you don't have to be suicidal or right at the end of your tether to warrant calling one of these services. So let's say Lifeline. You can actually call just to have a chat, to air something out that you feel like you can't tell anyone else. I'm very lucky and hopefully you two are as as well. I'm sure you you have someone in your life that you can speak to about anything with some people who have no one and you can always call one of these lines and just blurt out whatever's been in your head and that can be a very helpful thing to do because once we speak something out loud we're able to process it and better understand it and we can actually get someone else's perspective and no matter who you are who you know and who you have around you you can call lifeline or just have a chat about how you're going and that's a, a free service that's going to help you and it doesn't have to be you in a in a crisis mm-hmm. situation to get to that point it might help you might stop you getting to that that crisis situation and if you really can't speak about it write it down it's like yeah you can just write it out write out how you're feeling just get it out in some way so that you can have a look at it once you do write it out or speak it out, that's when you can realize, oh, that doesn't actually make sense, maybe. Mm-hmm. Or that, uh, once I've said that out loud, even to myself, maybe hopefully to someone else, but even to myself, speaking that out loud, actually, yeah, in my head, it was like, oh, that, that, that is the reality. That's, that's definitely what's happening and that there's no way out or whatever. But when I've spoken it, you find holes in your own story and then that helps you to be able to actually understand it in a different way rather than just going around in circles. Mm. I had a mentor that I worked with years ago and um, part of her uh, teachings was that healing is listening. And I think that works for both parties in these sorts of circumstances. You know, it's very healing uh, for someone who's who's in a place of struggle for us to listen to them. Um, but it all, it's also helpful for, you know, if I'm in a place of, of uh, you know, mental being mentally unwell or, you know, suicidal ideation or any of those sorts of things to hear myself speak through it. As you're talking about Cal listening to myself, that's also very healing. So, you know, it all starts with just creating that space for conversation and and for sharing uh, without judgment, without fear of, you know, being embarrassed or any of that sort of stuff. And that can be very hard for those of us, I guess, particularly men and I don't have the answers to any of this stuff. Um, just a bunch of opinions, I suppose, which I have an opinion on everything. Um, but perhaps that's that's where we see greater issues with this for men is because, as you were talking about before, it's it's traditionally, I suppose, unfortunately, being seen as as a show of weakness um, to admit that I don't have my shit together, um, which means I'm not going to talk about it to anybody because it's embarrassing. Um, and so I think. The talking is good and, uh, you know, I've spoken several times on our podcast and on a couple of others about prevention, but even just, you know, chatting with you today, Cal, it's like, I wish that mental um, well-being was seen like physical fitness for blokes, you know. Most blokes want to be physically fit and capable in some way, shape or form, and if we had that same approach to our mental well-being, it's like, I want to be mentally fit and not see it as, oh, gosh, mental health you know, means you're a bit of a weirdo, you know, what are you, weak or something? Yeah. Uh, instead of seeing it as a positive trait. A mind and body are totally interconnected. So 100%. Like, 
it's hard to have one without the other. Like looking after your physical health is going to mean that you're looking after your mental health. It's rare that you'll meet someone who is really on to looking after their physical health who doesn't also prioritize their mental health because they, they work hand in hand. And mm-hmm. It looks something good for your body with your sleep and your nutrition and your training. That's going to really help your mind. And then also, I suppose there's the subconscious message you're sending yourself, which is that you, you value yourself uh, and love yourself. And you're showing that, by the way, by your actions. And um, then, no surprise, that manifests in the rest of your life. And of course, we can't control the things that happen to us. And we're all going to go through really tough circumstances because life happens and keeps happening. The best we can do is be as prepared as we can and prepared and not paranoid mm. uh, by when we have the opportunity, doing the right things, getting enough sleep, eating well, um, maintaining our friendships, getting outside meditating, uh, doing whatever you do to get some mental space, reading a book, um, having a bath, whatever it is, healthy coping mechanisms, actually putting those in place and being consistent and all the while subliminally telling yourself that you are valuable and you're worth looking after. And when you do all these things, which we do have to keep doing. It's a lot of. It's a bit of an ask, you know. Looking out for yourself. It's not a. It's not a one stop fit, fixes everything kind of kind of deal. We've got to do it every day. But if you do do that, you are going to love and value yourself, which is going to mean that you can love and value other people, and you're going to get that back in your return, which I think is what we all want. And you're going to be in the healthiest spot as possible. So when the shit hits the fan you'll be in the, the best position to be able to weather the storm. I think where things go really wrong for people is when they're not valuing themselves or for whatever reason, not able to prioritize their own health as they go through life and and do that management of physical and mental health as we go along and not be trying to um, do our best in that regard. And then when two, three, four things go wrong at once, it becomes totally overwhelming and we're not actually physically well enough to be able to get through that like perhaps we otherwise would. Mm. So, yeah, we obviously those things that happen, they're going to happen, you know, losing a job, end of a relationship, losing a loved one. Unfortunately, that's, that's part of life. We can't control that. But a lot of what we can control is whoever, whoever we are, we can do our, our best to look after ourselves all the time and put ourselves in the best position to be able to yeah weather those storms when they come up and it's a big it's a big ask easier said than done and of course there's some days where you say stuff it and no you're not going to go to the gym and yes you are going to sit on the couch all day and binge watch whatever show and that's important too because that's Mm -hmm. self-care too and it's it's a bit of a balancing act because you on one side we can not be doing any of the things that you need to do to look after your health at all on the other side you can be going too hardcore and being too hard on yourself and being a perfectionist and not giving yourself any space to uh, unwind and being too hard on yourself so it's it's walking that line in between and i guess that's that self-awareness and and understanding and underneath all that has to be that yeah you love you love yourself you want the best for yourself and that's going to mean that you get the best for the people that you care about, which mm. I think is is most people's priority. There's no helping anyone else and there's no being the man or the woman that you want to be if you're not loving yourself first. Now, Cal, I'm going to set a bit of a challenge for you, mate. Uh, <laughs> with everything we've discovered in this episode and everything you've talked about on your podcast, uh, Young Blood Men's Mental Health, I'm going to ask you a question, which is probably going to be difficult. We'll see how you go. Uh, if you had a thousand tradies in business in a room, what's one piece of advice you would like to leave them with? Be honest. Be honest. You are more of a man and you are able to be the man that you want to be if you can front up how you're actually going. 
and understand that facing that takes true strength, but it will make life so much better for everyone if you're able to do that. And it doesn't make you less of a man or weak. In fact, I would argue the opposite. And you know that because it's bloody hard to do. Mm -hmm. But just, just do it and lead by example and find out that on the other side of that fear was something much better and not not what you imagined it could be and, and not the uh, things going as wrong as they possibly could, but actually um, being able to help yourself on, on the other side of that by coming forward. And vulnerability is the word we hear a lot. I think that's almost in buzzword territory now where it's like almost going uh, a bit far and I think can put men off sometimes because we think vulnerability is like crying uh, and being a totally open book and uh, in some ways for blokes I think maybe it's equated with being being feminine and things that they don't want to be so I had a guest on the show who said that they like to say honesty instead of vulnerability and I sort of like that and maybe that's a better way for some men to think about it can you be honest with yourself if you've got these feelings inside of you and they're not going away and they're governing how you're living your life and you're going around with this dark cloud over you, when it's hard, can you be honest with yourself and say, I'm not okay right now. I need to take some action here or this isn't going to get better. And if it's not enough to do it for myself, I need to do it for the people who love me. And I think if you can be honest, then you'll be all right and everyone else will be all right. Uh, and that takes a lot of strength and a lot of bravery to do that. And it doesn't mean you have to change much else. You can still be the the same uh, affable, fun-loving, takes-the-piss bloke as you always were. It's just in those moments, if you get there, just be be honest, no matter how hard that is, and then take the action necessary to start making it better. Um, and don't just sit and wallow and say stuff in your mind because it's a dangerous host of it. Mm, great words. Love it. Uh, so, Cal, uh, anyone listening that wants to go check you out, maybe check out the podcast uh, or any of your uh, story, uh, what's the best place to do that? Yeah, so kids these days, it's all uh, Instagram and TikTok promotion-wise. So Young Blood Men's Mental Health on Instagram and Young Blood Mental Health on TikTok for all your younger listeners. Uh, and then the podcast is available on all podcast platforms we do professional studio video as well as the audio so you can watch the episodes on spotify and on youtube and yeah i'd love everyone to go and have a listen to it there's something for everyone on there it is directed to young men but it's also for women in their lives it's for parents it's for colleagues it's for teammates it's for grandparents it's for anyone who's human and is interested in mental health and is perhaps looking for uh, a different perspective or some insight into a particular mental health topic we've done just about every single one imaginable by now so you'd be able to find a story in there that you can relate to and it might help giving you some some tips or uh, a different way of thinking about a particular issue that you might be confronting in your own life and then if you do get something out of it please share it on with with someone else because uh, we want to reach as many people as possible so everyone knows that they're not alone no matter what they're going through great stuff well, Cal uh, thanks for your time today mate thanks for sharing thanks for listening um, thanks for being honest and uh, yeah go check Cal and his podcast out um, and yeah there's some great tips in here so do something thanks guys it was great to talk to you I loved your questions it was a really interesting chat and I can tell that you both really care about your stuff and your listener community and you seem like really great people so it's been a pleasure to have the chat and, and thanks for taking the time to have me on thanks Cal. pleasure thanks Cal. Mm-hmm.